Well, hey, I'm David and welcome to In The Growth Space. I'm your host and it's really great to have you here with us today. You know, I started this podcast about a year and a half ago and I did it because, you know, I've been really privileged to have some great conversations with leaders from around the world about leadership and about culture and, and company and personal growth. And I really wanted to be able to share some of these conversations with people in my community, but I didn't want to stop with those just in my own personal inner circle or even just in my inner circle groups. I wanted to really make an impact on leaders and, and companies beyond where I've been able to, to make an impact up to this point. And so if you're new to this podcast, first of all, welcome <laughs> and, and, and thanks for checking us out. I, I really do appreciate it. And, and I'd love it if at the end of the podcast, you would just go to the rating part of your podcast app and, and give us a rating and review. It really helps us to make a, a, a wider impact with uh, the message of growth that we're sharing. Also, if you hit subscribe, You'll never miss an episode, and I'd really greatly appreciate you subscribing. Now, we're certainly making a, 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 a march into the new year, and it's really great to, to kick off the new year with some new content. And, and this week, I'm sharing a teaching that I did on a recent six-figure mentorship call that I did for the Empowered Living community. I'm, I'm really blessed to be one of the mentors in this program, and I'm, I'm, I'm able to share my insights and, and, and certain lessons with uh, a really amazing community of people. This community has been built by my mentor and my personal coach, Paul Martinelli. Now, if, if for some reason you don't know who Paul is, he's the guy who wrote a $1 million check to, to John Maxwell. And, and built the John Maxwell team. And he built that organization into a company and an organization with over 40,000 people from all over the globe. And then a couple of years ago, he sold his interest in the organization and he's now mentoring and coaching clients like me from, from around the world. So in this program and in this lesson that I shared, my, my lane, my, my, my lane in the program is leadership and, and company culture. And today I'm gonna to share five behaviors and I, I call them fundamentals, but they're five behaviors that I see really great leaders exhibiting. And I actually then do some more in-depth teaching around each of them. Now we held this session on Zoom, so you'll probably notice some difference in audio quality from this microphone that I have, um, but it was also captured on video. So you can always go to my YouTube channel if you'd like to just watch uh, me deliver this on video and um, uh, feel free to go there as well because we post up to the YouTube channel there. So let's go ahead and get into the lesson now, and then I'll be back afterwards just to give a quick recap of, of the lesson. I've titled this lesson um, as how to be a high-performance leader for a high-performance culture. And I said this earlier, but company culture and leadership are so intertwined. You you really have to work on your leadership skills if you want to have a high performing culture. And just to illustrate my point, I, I wanna share just a quick story. Um, I was working with a managing partner of a law firm recently. Um, he, was, he was losing some of his younger, sharp lawyers. And, um, even though the, the firm had, had won a Best Places to, to Work Award, he knew that they still had some work that they needed to, to do um, because their culture, um, they were getting some turnover. And so we had our discovery meeting and I asked him a lot of questions and I helped him to uncover the, the cause of, of this turnover. And um, as we discussed uh, creating some cultural fundamentals, he kind of, he became aware that his own leadership needed refining. He saw some things that he um, didn't realize that he was doing that um, led the, some of these, these young professionals to, to be wanting to leave and go somewhere else. Um, 
And I mean, the, the this lawyer, this managing partner, um, he, he's an expert in his field. He is a sharp lawyer. He um, is, is top of his game. And the fact was, though, is that he was holding on to some things, some of his own paradigms, his own ways of, of thinking. And um, he was holding on to those to um, the detriment of, of his team. He thought um, that law firms should operate in, you know, in his way or his paradigm. And what he realized then was that um, his leadership needed to change and, and his culture wasn't going to change until his, his leadership changed. And so um, at, at, at the first point here I want to make, it's that um, leadership begins with me. So if, if, if I'm going to change the culture in my organization, in my department, um, in my team, um, it has to start with me. So leadership starts with the individual. And, and, and I know you know this, if you've been around this community for any length of time or around leadership development for any length of time, that's probably not anything new to you. Um, and, and you realize that self-leadership is, is the hardest form of leadership. And yet, I think that that's where we have to start and we have to think about our own leadership behaviors if we want to become a high-performing leader. So what does that mean? And how can we lead ourselves so that we become a high-performing leader? So we first have to look at our habits. Um, I'm sure that you've heard people talk about setting goals. I mean, you know, Paul talks about setting goals and, and all high achievers set goals. And um, we talk about getting your goals, but really I believe that high performing leaders know that they don't get their goals. They, they get their habits. So if you have a, a, a habit of procrastinating or if you're habitually late for meetings, or if you have a habit of, of hitting snooze uh, on the alarm, you get what those, those habits serve up. I see you, Karen, smiling. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we all have some that, that, that you know, we, we struggle with and, and we, we have to work on. And so that's why we always wanna start with ourselves and, and work on our habits. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little story of myself here in just a minute, but um, let me just encourage you tonight to think about the habits that lead to the results that you're getting. Um, because at the end of the day, um, our, our habits are what lead to our results. So when I, um, when I work with um, uh, companies and company leaders, I, I ask them, I tend to ask them at the beginning of my um, engagement with them, you know, what behaviors will get you the results that you want? And, and, and the answers to those questions sometimes takes a little bit of time to, to facilitate. And I would ask you to, to think about that for yourself. Ask yourself what behaviors and what ways of being will get you the results that you want. Um, High-performing teams and, and, and a high-performance focused culture always look at the behaviors that lead to success. And when I start to, to work with a, a company, um, like I said, I, I always ask them, you know, questions like, um, who on your team would you most like to clone. If you could clone somebody on your team, who is it? Who would you like to clone? And, you know, have 50 of them all around. And, and then when, when they have a picture of that person in their mind, what I do is I'll take it one step further and ask them, what do they do? Why, what do they do that makes you want to clone them? And that, that begins the process of kind of thinking into these success behaviors. So ask yourself, 
you know, who is a leader that you admire and that frankly you would like to emulate? And what do you see them doing? What are their behaviors? What are their success behaviors? You know, my guess is that um, you'll see some foundational behaviors, some, some things that I'm gonna talk about tonight um, that really help them to stand out from the leadership crowd. And I, I like to call these just keystone behaviors for success. These are really foundational behaviors that for me anyway, I, I think these are what great leaders exhibit. And I'm gonna talk about each of these five, but um, and if any of you have been on some of my previous calls where I've talked about culture, um, you'll, you'll probably, uh, some of these will be familiar to you. But the, the first one is, to listen generously. So the first behavior is listening generously. The second one is to speak straight. And then the third one is to be for others, being for others. The fourth is honoring commitments. It's a big one. Uh, those are, I'll, I'll get into the teaching on that in just a second. So I get so excited about all of these. Um, so be for others, honor commitments, and acknowledge and appreciate. Um, so those are the five that I believe are foundational for, for leaders who are high performers. I'll, I'll just kind of go through them again, and I'll dive in. Listen generously, speak straight, be for others, honor commitments, and acknowledge and appreciate. So what I wanna do is then give you some insights on these, these keystone behaviors and, and honestly, how you can incorporate them in your own leadership. Because the one thing I like to do is give some very practical ways that you can implement some of the things that are, are in this lesson. Now, when I talk about listening generously, I'm gonna start with this one because I believe this one is probably one of the hardest fundamentals um, to, to master. I, I, I can speak for myself. I know it is for me. Um, and it, I think that in today's environment, there are so many things that are screaming for our attention and they, it, it pulls our focus away from, from listening generously. And when you think of listening generously, it's, it's more than just not speaking. It's, it's really the skill of being present and engaged. And in a lot of ways, it takes quieting all of the noise in your head and letting go of your need to either agree or disagree with what's being said. And it, it, it means really creating space for others to express themselves without judgment. And that takes, that takes, some, takes some discipline and it takes some practice. And it also requires some care and empathy so that we can really listen to understand because that's really what the core of listening generously is all about. And I, I, I say that this particular fundamental is, is one of the more difficult ones because we have so many things going on in our brains. And um, so oftentimes we're not really listening because sometimes what we're doing is we're just anticipating what we're gonna say next, or we're, we're gonna uh, maybe anticipate what the, the person who's speaking is gonna say. Um, and we're, then we're, we're judging in our heads whether we agree or we, we, we don't agree. And all of this then just blocks our focus and um, it, it prevents us from really listening generously. So our goal with listening generously is to, to listen um, with an understanding, uh, a, a goal to understand. So we want to understand what, what they're saying, um, all of the nuances behind it. And, and we can't do that unless we clear all of the, the noise in our head. Now, one of the tips that I can give you on this is um, to eliminate as many distractions as you possibly can. I know that I had, um, someone who I used to go visit regularly. And when I went to their conference room, we'd meet in the conference room 
and they would actually put their back to the door or the, the, there was a glass conference room. They'd put their back to that glass uh, area so that they didn't get distracted with people walking back and forth and they could actually just focus um, on the person that they were talking to. So eliminate distractions. Um, you know, if, if you're not on a, on a call like this, turn away from your computer. Uh, if you're talking to somebody in person, um, make sure that you're not, you know, you, you don't have a screen in front of you, but look directly at them. Um, and if you are on a, a, a call like this one, try to shut down everything else and just be present. Shut down browser tabs, um, you know, other windows, um, so that you can keep your focus on the individual that, that's in front of you. And I know that there's a lot that I could teach on this particular fundamental, this particular leadership behavior, um, but I want to get to some of the other ones as well. So, uh, and I also want to leave some time for, for Q&A, but uh, once we've listened generously, then we can speak straight. And I describe speaking straight as speaking honestly in a way that moves a situation forward. It's, it's really about making clear and, and direct requests. And we have to um, ask questions even that may be uncomfortable or raise some conflict. But the goal is to create success for, for the team or for the relationship or for the organization. So it's, it's moving a situation forward, getting some resolution, even if it's just slight movement, but it's, it's raising the, the uncomfortableness of the conversation. And it's also about going directly to the person or people involved. So oftentimes I, I work with leadership teams and there are a lot of times when leaders will go to their boss to talk to somebody else's boss on their behalf because they're having a conflict. Speaking straight is not doing that. Speaking straight is actually going directly to the person or the people that, that are involved and address the issues. And if you've ever had one of those kinds of situations where you have a pit in your stomach, um, those kinds of conversations, those are the ones where speaking straight is needed. And, and one of the hardest parts of speaking straight is honestly, it's just getting started. And I, I, I wanna give you a tip that I've used and I'm not uh, someone who loves to have these difficult conversations. It's, it's really contrary to my personality, but after having five teenagers, I've gotten pretty good at, <laughs> at that. Um, so um, having these conversations is, is actually not so bad anymore. But one of the tips I can give you is simply just to acknowledge the difficulty of the, uh, of the conversation. So you might say something like when you're, you know, when you're just trying to get started, you might say something like, you know, this is a really hard thing for me to do, but I wanna share something with you. So just acknowledging that it's hard helps you to get started. Um, the other thing that I've done too is I've said something like, you know, I feel really uncomfortable about this, but I, I, I want to share this with you. So when you acknowledge your own discomfort, it reduces the, the likelihood that that other person is going to take what's, what's said the wrong way. And so just acknowledge your own discomfort. And sometimes what that does is it kind of lowers the, the temperature of, of the conversation. Um, another part of speaking straight that I, I really want to say is that um, this, this particular leadership fundamental is often misunderstood. Speaking straight is not just simply, you know, dumping on the other person or Sometimes I've heard it say, you know, it's, it's people say, well, I'm just gonna give them a piece of my mind. And, and that's really not what I'm talking about because um, that's really not uh, moving the situation forward. It, it, speaking straight really requires us to be super thoughtful in how we communicate 
um, so that our message can be heard and, and, and we can actually move the situation forward and we can make progress. And so just keep in mind that the goal of this particular fundamental, this leadership um, behavior is to move the situation forward and, and make some progress. A lot more I could teach on on that as well, but I wanna keep on going. So after listening generously and speaking straight, um, the next uh, keystone be behavior is being for others. And I, I, I think that all of the great leaders that I know and those that I want to emulate are ones that exhibit this behavior. Um, uh, they, they, they're, they're for others, which means they're supporting someone else's success. They're, they're supporting other people's success. And this particular behavior, I think, is really so entwined too with the other uh, keystone behaviors because if, if I'm really for others, then I have to help them by listening generously. And I have to help them by speaking straight. And sometimes I have to help them by, by honoring their commitments or having them honor their commitments. So being for others means that we have to go beyond being nice and superficial. You know, when we truly care for, for other people, we're then willing to have those challenging conversations and we're, we're, we're willing to risk misunderstanding while we're cleaning up and resolving issues that really get in the way of our success. And so when we're for others, um, that's, that, that's how we support and, and move things forward. And so I know that there are so many other behaviors um, that are in, in, involved in being for others but this one requires a lot of emotional intelligence as well. Um, what, what it really means is operating from the point of view that we're all in this together and I, I want somebody else's greatness to come out and I wanna support someone else's greatness and I want to help them become the best that they can be. And I, 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 that's why I say that all of the, the great leaders that I know exhibit this being for others and really uh, having other people's best interest at heart. And when we're exhibiting this particular behavior, um, we're, we're practicing one of the keys to, to you know, having a high-performing team as well. Because high-performing team, uh, teams is really, they're really about succeeding together, especially when it comes to, to company culture. It's, it's really all about being willing to really step in and, and help someone when, when that help is, is required and, and, and needed. So after being for others, the next uh, keystone behavior is honoring commitments. And I, I believe that this habit and, and this fundamental is, is key because there's no better way to earn people's trust than to be true to your word. So honoring commitments means that you're doing what you say you're gonna do when you say you're gonna do it. And this means being on time for all meetings, being on time for appointments, being on time for your promises. You know, I, I had given um, my my word that I would have proposals out by today to, to two prospects. And um, I had to work on a part of it over the weekend because I knew that I needed, I, I had this deadline. I had told them that I would have that, the, the proposal to them by November 1st. And um, so it's really important to, when you, when you make a commitment to honor it, and one habit that is um, related to honoring commitments is leaving enough time to account for surprises and delays. Um, and, and so as I say this, I, I kind of <laughs> chuckle at myself because, I mean, 
I'm guilty of this one. Um, I don't know if anybody else has ever had a meeting and, and they know when they need to leave. Okay, I'll make it personal. Has anybody ever had a meeting? I've had a meeting and I know when I needed to leave so that I, so I, I, I'd arrive on time. But I just needed to get one more little thing finished, just a little bit, you know, just a little bit more. And even if I knew that that means that there's no margin for error, and then what happens? You, you run into traffic, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. Am, am I the only one that does that? <laughs> okay, Francisco, good, good. <laughs> All right, good. Well, I don't feel so alone, man. Um, for years, I had allowed that thinking also to really be an excuse for when I arrived late. Oh, it was traffic. And all, but, but really at the end of the day, it was my fault. It wasn't traffic. I didn't leave time for, you know, those surprises. And so it hit me one time um, about, gosh, probably four years ago. I was, I was razor thin on a meeting where I had about 75 people in a room and they were waiting on me and they were all there. And um, I ran into some traffic and I told myself, I will never allow that to happen again. And it, it, it just kind of something switched inside of me. And I think that that particular situation cured me for the most part, <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. Um, you know, I, I honestly found that this was an area that I had to do better at in, in, in this leadership um, behavior. And I, one of the things that I was doing is that I was making unrealistic commitments and I wasn't organized. So I lost track of the commitments. And so in the past, I would say to somebody, hey, I'll have that proposal to you by November 1st. And then by November 3rd, I'd go, oh, crap, I forgot, you know, and I didn't have a follow up system. And so now I have a task system and I have a reminder system and I have things built in so that I'm reminded all, uh, all kind of all along the way. If I make a commitment, then I have a process that I walk through. And so um, I make it a practice to um Sometimes I have to even take a pause and just basically say, hey, I'll get back with you. Before I make a commitment to you, I need to take a look at my calendar and I need to uh, make sure that I can make this commitment. If I make a commitment to you, that I can deliver on it. So rather than saying yes right there on the spot, I've begun to say, you know, hey, let, let me look into my competing commitments um, before I make this commitment. And um, so, and then what I'll do is I use uh, kind of a hybrid system between electronic and, and digital or um, analog. I've got, I, I use the full focus planner. And so then I'll, I'll, I'll make notes in my full focus planner where I can review those commitments. And then because of the, the process that I go through with that, I can review those commitments and then, excuse me, and then if I make a commitment, I'll schedule them into my calendar and put them into my, my time block. And so what do you do when um, you make a commitment that can't be fulfilled because we're relying on others or circumstances you know, outside of our control? There's a lot of times when we make commitments and um, there's things that are outside of our control. And so honoring commitments requires that I engage with the other person that I've committed to at the earliest possible point to let them know. So if, if I'm waiting on something from somebody else in order for me to finish and deliver, if it looks like the other person is gonna be delayed, at the very earliest point that I can, I need to let the other person know and, and be able to then renegotiate and maybe say, hey, look, I am still waiting for um, this to come to me, so I'm gonna be late. How can we how can we renegotiate the delivery date instead of instead of Monday at five? Uh, how about Wednesday at nine a.m.? Would that work for you? That still honors your commitment because you're reaching out and you're being proactive. And you know, oftentimes when you do that, 
that helps them then to make necessary adjustments since there may be others affected down the line, not just your deliverable to, to them, but their deliverable to, to others. And so honoring commitments is, is all about communication. And I, I talk about this a lot with my emerging leaders is that so oftentimes no news is not good news. So when, when we have committed to something and if we don't communicate to uh, the other person, then that, that no news puts them behind the eight ball. And so um, we have to create communication, especially at the very first uh, moment that we realize that something is not gonna be uh, fulfilled. Okay, our last keystone behavior uh, is acknowledging and appreciating others. And this is especially true for our team. Um, at surface level, this fundamental seems pretty straightforward, acknowledging and appreciating. But there really are four parts to acknowledging and appreciating. Um, if we're going to be effective at, at meaningful appreciation, we've got to we've got to create all four of these parts. The first part has to be it has to be honest. So we have to we have to mean it when we say it. It can't be just something that we're saying just because we want to appease somebody. So there's nothing meaningful about appreciation if it isn't the truth. Second, it needs to be timely. We've got to do it right away. So we see something happen. We want to, we want to acknowledge somebody and appreciate them. It has to be honest. It has to be timely. And then third, it has to be specific. And that goes something like this. Um, hey, Tom, uh, I really appreciate how you handled that customer complaint. You know, it sounded like they were really upset and how you were able to talk with them so calmly and hold your composure was great. So that's, that's very specific, specific, timely, and it's honest. The last thing about meaningful acknowledgement and appreciation is that it has to be impactful. It has to be tied to the impact that it has on either the team or the organization. And um, that sounds something like this, using the, the, the previous um, example. Hey, Tom, I really appreciate how you handled that customer complaint. You know, it, it really sounded like they were super upset and, and how you were able to talk with them so calmly and hold your composure was great. I was afraid that we wouldn't do business with them again, but now they've placed three new orders. You really made a difference. So notice that acknowledgement and appreciation compared to, hey, Tom, nice job on that call today. That's not, you know, that, that's, that's like a throwaway. So it has to be honest, it has to be specific, it has to be timely, and it has to be tied to the impact. And so that's meaningful acknowledgement and appreciation. So if you adopt these five high performance leadership behaviors, not only will you um, have an, an, an improved leadership, but you will also create a, a high performing work culture as well. So um, I hope that was helpful. That went a, probably a little longer than I had thought, but I think we've got plenty of time for um, some Q&A and I'd love to, to entertain any Q&A that you guys might have. Yeah, okay, great. Shelly, hey, how are you? Good, David. Good, good topic. You know, you, uh, you helped me really feel good about an incident that I had to deal with uh, oh. last night. I, was, I had to, um, to call out a supervisor for unethical and um, deliberate, just some deliberate things that were a personal attack towards me and um, could have been embarrassing to me had I not been the type of person that said, wow, that was just wrong. And it, it was a Zoom class. Instead, I said, you know what? I have been traveling uh, through the weekend, just came back from a great conference and that was a personal attack. I have not slept in over 24 hours. So I'm going to tell everybody good night mm. later. And today I received a note from that supervisor furthering the incident. 
and I had to go back to the manual for the course. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm so proud of myself, David, because I did these four steps in my communication on return. Awesome. And so there was no, no return attack. It was just a call out of, you know, these are character things. These are integrity. Mm -hmm. These are areas where um, it does impact our performance. And if you want accreditation, um, you don't throw students under the bus. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. And so it was really good. And thank you. So you really helped me feel okay. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, you know, speaking straight it is, you know, it, it's so, it can be so hard, but it, 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 if it's done right, it will solve issues and it will, it will move the, the, those, those situations towards a resolution. And it sounds like that's, it's exactly what, what happened. And I, I did, I called it out is, is uh, an abuse of power. Mm that wasn't authoritative. It was an abuse of power because it was a personal attack to me. And I said, you know, we don't do those things here. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think that what's, what, what I'm hearing you say too, is as, as part of the culture, that's, and I, I love that you use that language. We don't do those things around here. That's not the way we do things. And so when you talk about the way that's behaviors, so those behaviors aren't tolerated and the one thing I always tell leaders is that if you have a crappy culture, then you have to hold a mirror up because it's a it's it's the it's the behaviors that you tolerate that create the culture. And so that's not that's not something that a lot of leaders like to hear, but it's the truth. Okay, so now for my question. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So um, I am I am a clinical counselor, and I have been operating an LLC since 2014. And during COVID, I went for the challenge to go corporate and start creating my own entire entity. I have been challenged with what does it feel like? What does it look like? What does that leverage mean? And I started out operating at a full, full ignorance. And I still have a lot there. The Maxwell team and a number of other teams have really been amazing help, but I still have, a, and it's, I've dealt with the imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> so how do I see myself at that next level to really feel and be that CEO level? Because it's so different from LLC. It's yeah. corporate now. Yeah. And I'm, intelligently struggling to wrap my head around it functionally in all other sources. Do you have a book or something that will help me, you know, well, step, step up? The, the first book that comes to my head, whenever you talk about books, I, I love books. The first book is that, that I can think about, and you, you mentioned it, 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 the imposter syndrome or the imposter experience, but um, Presence by Amy C Amy Cuddy um, is a is a great one. I've got it sitting on my shelf right over. I can actually point to it, um, and I think that that's a book that might help you with the um, positioning of. I, I think you're you're you, you maybe in your mind you're bringing this whole thing of being in you know a corporate you know be, being a corporation you're, you you went from a limited liability company to what a sub s corporation or yeah okay yes yeah. I mean honestly in my mind that all that is is it's a it's a paperwork change I mean so if you think about it as look it's just a paperwork change um, that's all it is um, I think it's it's a matter of how you're seeing that and um, just kind of making that shift in your mind. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Now, if you didn't catch those five behaviors or fundamentals, as I called them, um, here they are again. So the first is listen generously. Generous listening is, is so important for high performance and for great leadership. And then following that is speak straight. And speaking straight is all about moving a situation forward, making sure that we're moving forward. 
Now, number three is being for others. Sometimes uh, I might I might term this uh, you know being for the team, or also it can be also paraphrased as check the ego at the door because it's really all about the team. So the fourth behavior is honor commitments, and and this one is probably one of the most important ones to um, generate trust within a team, and and not only just within a team, but within an organization, with your clients. Uh, honoring commitments is incredibly important. Number five is acknowledging and appreciating, making sure that we're being very honest and specific and impactful with our with our acknowledgement and our appreciation. And if you are a company leader or perhaps you're a company owner, it, it, it and it really doesn't matter how large your company is, even if you're a solopreneur, I believe that these, each one of these need to be a part of your company culture. I, I think there are probably others that need to be, not probably, I, I know there are others that need, need to be added, but these I believe are really fundamental. They're foundational to high performance and having a culture where you have high performance. And as I started to say, it doesn't matter how small your company is or how large your company is, the way you do things around your organization is it matters and and if you want to have a high performing culture that attracts top talent and retains them especially in today's world retaining talent is so important high performers they want to they want high standards and, and they want to have clear benchmarks so by articulating your behaviors your fundamentals for your organization you're allowing people to see that and that will attract that top talent and quite frankly Keep the ones that you have uh, that you want to retain. So thanks so much for listening this week. I really hope that you'll go give us a five-star review and and also some feedback when you go rate us. Uh, Also, be sure to share the podcast with a friend because growing together is always so much more fun. So until next time, stay in that growth space and be well. (music) 